Bonjour and welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture to spice up your relationship with God. Here is your host, Stephanie Roussel, with a guest today. How do we overcome anxiety? How can peace really be a reality in our lives? More than ever, at least for me, I found that my daily life seems to fight me on my quest for peace. Because peace really is the antidote to anxiety. And that peace is found in practicing the presence of God and in finding ourselves in Christ. But what does that look like and how do we get there? More than ever, I think our world really conspires against us on this. So today, I'm welcoming Alan Fadling. I've had him on the show before, and today we're we're really diving into a very real, raw, honest conversation about overcoming anxiety and finding peace. It's an invitation to step into a life that's characterized by peace and grace and gentleness, a life that's a demonstration of the palpable, the tangible presence of God. God promises to be with us in Christ Jesus. That has to be the firm ground for our hope for peace. And the world makes it all but impossible. So which one are we going to choose and which one are we going to learn to cultivate? So Alan is sharing a very personal journey of his in his latest book, A Non-Anxious Life which is kind of a sequel to a previous book, An Unhurried Life, that I had him on the show for a couple of years ago. Alan Fadling is a frequent speaker, consultant, retreat leader with local churches and national organizations. He works with Interversity Christian Fellowship, Halftime Institute, Apprentice Institute, Saddleback Church, Open Doors International. And he speaks from the intersection of spiritual formation and leadership. And his content is truly approachable, usable, transferable. He has written several books, An Unhurried Life, An Unhurried Leader, A Year of Slowing Down, which is a devotional that I really like personally and that is on my kitchen table and that I read in the morning sometimes. So Alan Fadling, welcome back on the Gospel Spice podcast. Thank you for having me back. It's good to be with you. It's so good to be with you. I've really enjoyed slowly reading your book. Um... And I want us to talk a lot about so many of the things that are in there. So what I'm going to do for our time together is that I've picked up so many nuggets of Uh. wisdom and of insight through some quotes that I've collected. So I am a quote collector. And so I have some quotes. So I'm going to read a few. And then basically, you and I are going to talk about them because I really want to get the story behind your mind and Mm. and your experience of developing a non-anxious life. I think we all could benefit from uh, each other's insights in how we can grow in a non-anxious life. So one of the things you said, which, man, I felt right at home right away. You say, anxiety combined with perfectionism drove me to high standards and big achievements. What could be wrong with that? (laughs) Yes, what could be wrong with that? Well, maybe a few things. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I've called myself a recovering perfectionist for a while now. And early on, I imagined that my perfectionism was an asset. You know, it pressed me to very high standards. It kept me quite active, doing admittedly a lot of good things. But the mode itself is not a very delightful mode. It's demanding. It has a way of being anxiety provoking. Uh, and In the end, since nothing is perfect, it just breeds a great deal of dissatisfaction and eventually discouragement and actually becomes very energy draining. And so for that reason, I've realized uh, I like thinking about progress more than perfection. That seems to make better sense to me now. So instead of saying that you're a perfectionist, how would you describe yourself these days? I am hopefully on a journey of growing. I'm being Mm -hmm. transformed. I have not arrived. I will not arrive in this life. And uh, and sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. And all of that comes under grace and mercy. And uh, part of growing in grace is learning how much grace I need. And that has been a better mode for me than perfectionism has mm-hmm. been. Oh, absolutely. Right. Because it could, it could be so stressful to think about perfectionism or trying to do our very best all the time as not being freeing, but it actually is so freeing to embrace the grace of 
not having it all together. It, it really it's, that's is. That's the true peace. Peace is actually a word. I would say, I mean, it's going to sound so cliche to say that peace is the antidote to anxiety because it's so obviously true. But at the same time, that's what you're unpacking so profoundly. So peace, the peaceable kingdom of God is an expression of, I remember from your book, what is the peaceable kingdom of God? Well, I, I maybe the simplest way to say it is just as truly as peace is a fruit of God's spirit, right? Love, mm -hmm. joy, peace. We know the list. But what that means is that God is a God of peace and that the reign of God is a reign of peace. And that may my vision of God might be best served seeing God as having a great interest in peace dwelling in us, peace dwelling among us, peace coming to be at home even in our world. That This is on the heart of God. This is what God desires. I just think sometimes our vision of God does not look that way. He seems more demanding. He seems um, rather impatient. Maybe he seems mildly disappointed. And none of that has a way of bearing the fruit of peace in me. Well, you just described how I feel about myself, but not how <laughs> God feels about me, right? Yeah. It's we are the ones yeah. who are disappointed in ourselves, who are impatient with ourselves. And that is where anxiety comes in. But God is never the source of our anxiety. That's right. We do that to ourselves. Anxiety is not a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Amen. You know, and it's not the voice of God in my life. Yeah, we do that to ourselves. I think it's so important to hear this, that those thoughts, those anxious thoughts, it, they're not from God. They really are from our own, our own assessment of ourselves. And we don't assess ourselves the way God does. One of the ways I like to describe anxiety, um, often I'm asked, what's the definition? I'm not sure I'm a dictionary and I can offer that, you know, but, but I like to say that Anxiety is what my caring looks like when God's not much in the picture. Mm. Like when my caring is left to itself, when I think I'm the only one who cares or I'm the one who cares the most, then it begins to feel much more like anxiety and worry than it does about feel like genuine caring. And so that's been helpful. So part of the antidote for anxiety for me has been learning to practice the presence of God in the midst of anxious thoughts and anxious feelings and anxious physical sensations. And so that's that's been an important insight for me, practically speaking. And in the book, what I love is that you spend, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I've experienced the book, um, I'd be curious to hear if that's maybe, or how you would hope the reader to experience it. But in the beginning, you you paint this gorgeous, broad picture of what a life of peace and an a non-anxious life would look like. And then you take us into what you just described, practicing the presence of God and what it looks like. And you talk about gentleness and humility and joy and contentment. And I want us to talk about those things. And then you center us back on Jesus, which you've done throughout, but like even more so, and you remind us to fix our gaze on Christ. And and I think it is simple, but not easy. Would that be fair to say? I think that's a, a very good way to say it. I do think there's a simplicity about peace. It's, it's the nature of peace to be simple. It's the nature of anxiety to be complicated and distracted and frayed. Um, and so, yes, I, I've said that my anxiety actually is a kind of practicing of the absence of God, like my ruminating is something I do without much of a sense that God is present mm. and that God cares and that God is at work and that God is moving in my life, in the lives of others I'm concerned for or in the situations I'm worried about. Uh, and so practicing God's presence, one of the, one of the ways that uh, works for me is I'm learning how to let those moments of anxious feeling or anxious thought that just sort of come uninvited they land in my brain. They rise up from my emotions. I'm learning to let those be a kind of trigger or pointer to God. In the past, I let them be a trigger or a pointer to worrying and ruminating and fretting and cycling through scenarios and all kinds of stuff, predicting the future poorly. Uh, and so being able to bring my anxious thoughts and feelings into the presence of God to say, God, um, this really concerns me. I'm envisioning some outcomes here that 
I'm very much afraid of. But Lord, you will shepherd me. You are shepherding me now, and you will shepherd me in those moments I envision in the future. And maybe my anxiety is not the uh, the perfect predictor of the future it claims to be. You quote, uh, you attribute a quote to Mark Twain. I didn't know he was the one who had said it, but it's a quote that had so transformed my perspective on anxiety and worry. I grew up with a mother who was a master worrier. And so obviously mm. that ends up, you know, even if I don't think it would be in my nature, but it just cannot happens, right? And yeah. um, my the, the quote, as I remember it, and you quote it slightly differently, and I was so glad to hear is from Mark Twain. Um, I have lived through many a great catastrophes. Most of them have never happened. That is, right. that just was kind of a vaccine for me because it's like, why would I spend so much energy worrying about things and living through things that don't actually happen? Yes. It's silly. And yet... It is so familiar. Yeah. I've said uh, that the way I listen to anxiety or have listened to it in the past, you'd think I consider it my wonderful counselor. But maybe it's really much closer to a false prophet. It has been wrong so often. As you say, I've spent so much time and so much energy worrying and ruminating and imagining and envisioning a future that anxiety is painting for me. I sometimes think, what if I'd, if what if I had that time back? <laughs> what if I had that emotional energy back to just live my life in the only moment I have to live, which is now, in the presence of the God who is with me, a God of peace, a God of grace. And so, what I'm learning is, I'm learning to feel an anxious, and even just sort of be just one step removed from it, and say, "Up, oh, yeah, there, there it is, Alan worrying. What a familiar place that is." But since worry has been wrong so often, I think I will not put it behind the steering wheel. I think I will put it in the back seat. I don't know how to kick it out of the car exactly, but I don't want it running things. And, you know, just that little bit of distance from my anxiety, instead of imagining my anxiety is me, it's just good to remember, no, I have anxiety and I can decide what I would prefer to do about that. Throughout the book, several times you invite us into your experience of watching birds. And, and by the way, I love how you make it so personal. And there's a couple of scenes where you're describing, you know, looking out from your office in, and watching the birds. And I could really sense myself there. It You you mm. did it so well. You invite us so well into that moment. And you say, um, and you just said something you say in there, and I'm quoting you here, God cares for the birds who aren't really doing much to change the world. And I loved that. And then you continue to say, God's provision for me is more gift than paycheck. Why is that a mindset that we need in order to move from anxiety to a an awareness of God's provision for us? Well, I think maybe the simplest way to respond to your question is, is that beautiful little couplet of words Paul begins every one of his letters with, which is grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, grace and peace are very good friends. Grace, that sense of God's generosity, of God's empowering presence, of an abundance mindset, these are ways I understand the grace of God, and that grace bears the fruit of peace, peace within me, peace among us. And so they go together. When grace is absent, uh, often then peace ends up absent too. Mm -hmm. Or another way to say it is that my anxiety, instead of being a grace orientation, is a scarcity orientation. You're not going to have enough. Oh, I know the scriptures say the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want, but don't count on that. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's what anxiety wants to say to us. And I've just decided it's 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 got a mistaken vision of my life and of my future. And so I'm I'm not wanting it to be my guide anymore. Yeah. And, and I think that's what you do is that you help me take that step of being a step removed from my emotions, my anxiety, my worry, my fear, because a lot of what you're talking about with anxiety would apply to a lot of our negative emotions. You just talked mm. about the philosophy of, philosophy of scarcity versus the philosophy of abundance. I'm going to read um, a few lines from your book. I highlighted those because they just spoke to my gospel spice heart. And you mm. Say right there, um, let me pick up. The kingdom of God is the realm of limitless abundance because it is ruled by an eternal and infinitely good king. Now, I've, everything you write, it's like we can theoretically or head 
head knowledge agree with it. But again, what you're inviting us is, okay, let's move past head knowledge. Let's let's talk about experience here, which is why I love it because here we're all about tasting and seeing. It's, it's the yes. ingestion. You can't taste something without letting it change you somehow. So, so you're really saying, yes, God is good and the kingdom of God is limitless and it's a place of abundance. But do we actually really believe that? And you go on to say, um, when I've come to trust this as my daily reality, I found that in my anxiety, I'm grasping for something I already have. I'm seeking something I've already been given. Worrying in the presence of such a gracious God is like going hungry while seated at a lavish table full of fine food. Anxiety here is like a blindfold and nose plugs. I find that I can't perceive God's delicious provision at such an extravagant table. Anxiety makes us blind to the great goodness God is always providing. I mm. love this image of anxiety being a blind and nose plugs when I am seated at a table of abundance and lavish grace, but I, I can't even access it. I was very grateful for that passage too. I That is what, um, in my experience, that's what anxiety is like. It it's it um it dims my vision of the world uh, it, it feels like my world becomes this gray black and white sort of place instead of this bright beautiful creation of uh, a divine artist which is what our god is who our god is so i'm with you i i i am always leaning into what would this taste like in my experience I'm not willing to settle for knowing about God. I would like to know God. And I'm so glad that's what Jesus came to make possible. I'm so glad this is what he wanted to show us by the very way he lived. And I find the life of Jesus is a beautiful life. He, he lives abundantly. He doesn't just talk about abundance. And so I find that if I keep my eyes open, like just now, as you and I are talking, I can look out and I see the birds coming to my feeders. And every time I do that, you know, many times a day, I am just reminded of God's care and God's great creativity and that I am being very well cared for, not theoretically, but actually, even when something bad happens, even when something disappointing happens, these are not the greatest realities. They're real. I don't pretend they're not, but they're not the biggest realities. The The gracious presence of God is the great and overarching reality of our lives. As I'm listening to you, I'm reminded that, I mean, Jesus, his worst nightmare came to pass, literally, in ways that none of us could ever experience. I mean, he has experienced his worst nightmare more than any of us could ever experience a worst nightmare because that was the whole point. The reason why he did is that we wouldn't need to separation from God, which is exactly what you're talking about. He was separated from God so that we wouldn't need to be. And that is why he is God with us. He's the Prince of Peace. He's Emmanuel because he knows what it's like to have his worst anxieties come to pass and yet have the presence of God beyond, beyond the grave, literally. So um, mm. one thing you say, and another another quote, I, I'm telling you, I, I love a lot of your quotes and just little nuggets of wisdom. You say that anxiety mm. has a way of blinding us to the measureless faithfulness of Christ. So what I'm hearing you say here is, and back to what you were saying, it's there's a very self-centeredness to anxiety. It's my eyes are on me. Whereas you're reminding us to, no, 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 let's fix our, fix our gaze on Christ, the way Hebrews describes it. Um, what does it, can you give us an example of what it has looked like for you, maybe in a moment of, of deep crisis when, when things were really going bad? I don't know. I remember you on a flight, was it to Russia and almost terrible mm -hmm. things happened or COVID or you, you, you name examples mm -hmm. because this isn't a Pollyanna book. You're not saying, you know, because you're a Christian life is going to be good. No, 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 no. You're really inviting us into dark places and you're saying, but you know, God with us. I think of Jesus on that last night mm -hmm. with his inner circle. And it is in that context before they will experience all that will happen to Jesus and therefore what will happen to them. All of their hopes will be, will be utterly crushed. And it's in that context 
he, he begins his words to his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then later he talks about peace I give you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Well, I like that because about the best that our world can offer in terms of peace is a trouble-free, conflict-free moment. Well, how rare are those these days? They're very rare. And so what's remarkable about the peace of the kingdom is that this peace arises from within us. It doesn't come to us from outside us. If we're dependent on an external peace coming our way, we're going to wait a very long time. But if the Prince of Peace has made himself at home in our hearts through our trusting relationship, then that peace can arise within us. It can be a kind of I at the center of the storm. The storm is still real, but so is the eye of the storm. And it is possible to discover what it looks like to live in peace in the midst of trouble. So again, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's almost as though he's saying, don't let trouble in. Don't let trouble trouble you. It's still troubling, but you don't have to digest it. You don't have to breathe it in. You don't have to let it take up space in your soul. You can learn to let Jesus be the Prince of Peace in trouble. And when I say learn, it is a journey of learning. It's not a life hack. It's a process of learning from Jesus how to live in his peaceful way. In that passage, if I recall correctly, you describe the locked doors, right? The disciples are hiding out of anxiety and fear. They're trying to be, they're trying to create their own eye of the storm by locking themselves into this room because they don't understand what is going on. And they're trying to keep the storm outside, but the anxiety, the fear is very real and it's very much in the room. And then, so they're locking the doors, quote unquote, against anxiety, but yet it's coming in, but yet, and then Jesus comes in and he gives them his peace. And then he does it again for Thomas. That is so personal. So how has he done that for you? You, you've, you say at some point in the book that this was such a hard book for you to write because it was very personal and, and you are so vulnerable. Uh, you mm. come across not as a teacher as much as you do a student, which is so appreciated. And so mm. for you, how, has, how have you developed a life a non-anxious life, a life where Jesus is your Prince of Peace. Yeah, I sort of hinted earlier that one mm -hmm. of the practices, I, I love the simplicity of Psalm 23, that the Lord is my shepherd and that I shall not want. So that has become a kind of brief prayer that I pray. It's an affirmation that I offer when I feel uh, swept over by anxiety. And I still feel that. I'm in my 60s. And still something unpleasant will happen or something will surprise me and I will feel anxiety on, on a, you know, an eight or a nine on a scale of 10. And it feels like it threatens to paralyze me or it threatens to hinder me or it threatens to drive me into unhelpful activity. So there's just been a lot of situations. Now, some of these are admittedly first world sorts of things, but you mentioned the traveling. Maybe nothing pushes my anxiety buttons, like being in some other part of the world and then things don't go the way the airlines promised they would, which happens more and more these days in my experience. But I was once at our local here in Southern California, our local airport. I'm standing in the uh, entryway, getting ready to clear security, and I check my pockets and I haven't got a wallet. Now I'm traveling to India and... Nobody there is going to be paying for anything that I need to do while I'm there for two weeks. And so immediately I felt this wash of anxiety, probably a big rush of adrenaline, uh, which often is what our feelings of anxiety are from a physical vantage point. And when that happened, it's as though my brain just shut down. And all I was left with was instinct. This little tunnel of, I must survive. What will I do? I, uh, this is a catastrophe. Nothing will go well. And, and you, f I can so relate to this. Like I'm nodding my head off for those who are, uh, you know, just listening, not watching. Cause I can so relate to this and, and this feeling of dread that is somewhere between your gut, but also somehow your brain goes foggy. Like you cannot yeah. think straight. You literally are overwhelmed 
with the inability to think straight, which is what you actually need in that moment is to think straight, but that's being stripped away from you. You are relying, like you said, on this tunnel vision instinct. Oh, I I feel your pain so deeply right now. So what happened? So what was beautiful was that I had been for some time then practicing this little prayer. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Sometimes I would uh, paraphrase it. I would say, the Lord is shepherding me right now. This might not turn out as bad as anxiety predicts. That's sometimes how I would, I would say it. I am not kidding you when I say the moment I prayed that prayer, it's as though the fog lifted and my brain came back online and my soul was in the presence of God who cares. And suddenly creative thoughts began to flow. Like, well, my wife just dropped me off. She's 10 minutes from the airport. She has a wallet. She has one of our two credit cards. So I called her. She turned, you know, turned around at the next exit. And within 10 minutes, she was at the airport. So I used her credit card in India all week. I didn't need anything else in my wallet because I had my passport. If I'd forgotten that, the trip was not happening because I needed a visa for it, for India. And so literally within about five minutes, it was completely resolved. I will tell you, there were times in the past where that might have utterly paralyzed me. And I might have really gotten in trouble, not because of forgetting my wallet, but because I listened to anxiety so attentively. So that's one of the things I'm often wanting to say is there's an odd thing that I've done to myself where I have imagined sometimes that my anxiety is an asset. Like, I really can't live without it. I There's a line, Dallas Willard uh, said, I heard him at least say it once, uh, I think more than once, but he said, you know, anything you could do in anxiety you could just do a lot better in peace. What's strange is the first time I heard him say that, something in my gut said, oh, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if I'll get anything done if I don't have my anxiety. I don't know if I'll keep my edge if I don't have my anxiety. So part of writing this book was wrestling into this strange belief of mine that I needed my anxiety. That if I didn't have my anxiety, no one would know I cared. Well, It turns out peace is a better way to care than anxiety is. Peace is more productive. It's more creative. It gives me access to all kinds of resources that anxiety prevents me access to. So peace is just a better way to live in all the ways I imagined anxiety was helping me. You said earlier how grace and peace are connected. You, you do that a lot in the book. You you connect pos- positively or negatively. You do grace and peace and then pride and anxiety, for example, or, you know, you do that a lot. And I love this. You talk about, um, practically speaking, you talk about what you, ha- having picked up from other authors, you call the little virtues. And you talk about Francis de Salle, which I love because he's French. So I'm, I felt right at home yes. there. I, um, but right. again, growing up atheist, I never knew anything about him until much later. And I needed actually American authors to tell me about my French compatriot. Isn't that a sad story? But uh, anyway, how about that? Yeah, the body of Christ works in mysterious ways in that sense. But uh, you talk about the little virtues and how in our Western ambitious world, we think things like anxiety are necessary. We we need big things. We need drama and glamour and extreme stories and extreme ways of life when, no, it's the little virtues. And you talk about humility and patience and gentleness and dependence and surrender. How have you learned at the feet of your beloved Savior and Lord, to to practice those? What does it look like? Well, yeah, it looks like a journey is what it looks like. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, so I'll just give you a real-time example. Lately, I've noticed how impatient I get on the freeways. Here in Southern California, every time you get on a freeway, you feel like you've just joined a NASCAR event. And everybody's in a race, and everybody's trying to win. And I just finally realized here, literally in the last month or two, I don't want to be in a race. What do I win if I win this race? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so many of the races that we're urged to enter by our cultural values don't win us anything that matters. You know, we imagine, well, if I have lots of money, if I win that race, then I'll be joyful and happy and so very satisfied. But then Jesus says, you know, 
Your life really doesn't consist in the abundance of your possessions. Your soul does not have a wallet or a closet. Um, and so life is not measured by these things. More money might just mean more worries. For many, it does. Uh, the idea of uh, of big achievements as proof of your uh, goodness or your uh, value, imagining that would lead to peace. Well, this is where your question earlier, if I think my peace is a paycheck I have to keep earning, well, then every two weeks when the paycheck comes, I have to have earned it. And peace as something I earn is an absolute con contrast. It's it's a uh, um, it's a false equation. Peace is always a gift. Peace is the gift of a person. It is from the Prince of Peace that I receive peace. And so this Prince of Peace, when he describes himself, says, I am gentle and humble in heart. Well, if the Prince of Peace is gentle and humble in heart, then what will that say to the invitation he's extending to me about how I will live? See, humility isn't about being a nobody. It's about not trying to make yourself a somebody. Amen. That's a lot of pressure. Amen to that. <laughs> oh, come on. Like if you've got to manage a social media persona day after day after week after week after month after month and impress people, that is exhausting. That is not a good way to live. You say that it's it's a slow process and you you use the word journey. And, and I love that because again, it is so countercultural because another thing we want is instant. It has to be instantly delivered. I'm waiting for my Amazon package. It should be at my door before I've even ordered it. Otherwise that's not satisfactory. But you're inviting us to slow down, which is very much the theme of your ministry and hurried living. And so you say, another thing you say is that you're inviting us to take time. And that's why I think I love how the book is formatted into 14 chapters that are that are meaty. I mean, you, but you don't want to navigate through those 14 chapters in 48 hours. You want to take the mm. time, I don't know, a chapter a week and then chew on it so that it really makes its way. So you can taste it, you can digest it, you can see it actually transform you. Um, you say storing up immense amounts of unprocessed and unpracticed insights is only going to provoke anxiety. I thought mm. this was a light bulb moment for me in a way, because that is so much what our culture does. It throws all sorts of information at us, including in church, including, you know, yeah. Christian leaders throwing information at us and then hoping at some point during this year, we're going to process it. But if we're not invited to process as we go along, we're honestly not going to do it. So you're giving us permission to really, really slow down and to be okay to not have anxiety reduced dramatically the first week we're trying. And it's okay. That is a journey. This is what I keep wanting to say. My learning to live a non-anxious life is a slow and steady journey. And the slowness of it is the sureness of it. The fact that it's slow means that this change might last. Quick changes also change quickly again back to where they were. So being able to make this walk with Jesus in his way of peace is a way of deepening our experience of peace. And that has been um, such a gift for me to be patient, uh, to realize that God is more patient than I am, not less patient than I am, that God's approach to me is gentle when my approach to me has often been rather harsh, uh, maybe I would do well to treat myself as God treats me instead of the way I'm tempted to treat me. Mm. Amen to that. I think we all need to learn that. We see it with the disciples, right? They were learning that. I see Peter learning to slowly treat himself the way Jesus treats him. Yeah, that's, yeah, I want to chew on that some more. I I, you know, I wish we could have a few minutes of silence to just kind of chew on that. How do we spend enough time with Christ? How do we know him well enough that we actually start treating ourselves the way he treats us? That is a question that we can learn to lean into for our whole lives. Yeah. You know, it's praying with a bit of imagination that when I see Jesus treat somebody the way he does, uh, the blind person on the side of the road, Bartimaeus, in my own places of blindness, isn't Jesus being as attentive to me as he is to that man? Isn't Jesus seeing me in my weakness, in my shortcomings, instead of with Pharisee eyes to judge, 
to exclude doesn't Jesus come to me look into my eyes and and come as the merciful gracious and peaceful presence that he is mm-hmm. well i have to ask what does my imagination see and am i learning to imagine him as he shows himself in the gospel pages that he is that very same jesus today with me in what i'm facing and what I'm wrestling with, and what I'm experiencing. And it doesn't end with me, because at the end of the day, this isn't a a self-centered quest to rid ourselves of anxiety. Because I think the greater picture, as you make clear as well, is that, well, once we have, we, we live in awareness of how much our life has been blessed and graced, then we go and bless and grace others. Just like Jesus does with Bartimaeus and in so many times. So it's, I mean, the end game isn't me, 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 myself, and I, and my anxiety. It's about how do I then turn around and embody peace in the name of Christ to the world around me? I think that's one of the great gifts that the church could give to its world, to this world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe that's the element of the good news our world today most needs, is the peace of Christ in us, the peace of Christ among us. And then that piece being expressed into the world. I wonder if folks in the world uh, picture Christians as a source of peace these days. I wish they would. I wish we were that. I think we could be that more. I think I really do think that's something of what Jesus came to make possible. And it's got to begin in us and among us before it can move beyond us. We are truly the body of Christ in, in so many ways. And going back to... Um... Something you were saying about the being embodied. I mean, we are body, soul, and spirit. And so when we're talking about tasting and seeing, there is a physical element to it. How is this not just a um a quest for the spirit or the soul? What how what is a how is our body such an integral part of that journey towards peace? It, it's got to be because my body is a big part of my anxiety. Uh, so if I don't learn to embody peace then thoughts of peace with an anxious body is not going to work very well. Uh, and by that, I mean, I I am by nature and maybe nurture, uh, I'm a very thinking oriented person. You know, we all have our preferences. That's one of mine, uh, which is to say that sometimes I've made the mistake of imagining that I could think away my anxiety while it still lived in my cells like in my guts or in my shoulders or in my in the tightness of my chest. And so learning spiritual practices that engage the body, you know, uh, breath prayer has been a great gift. Being still, physical stillness. Sometimes if you talk to a therapist about panic, one of the approaches, and I'm not a therapist, so I'm not offering advice, but one of the approaches to quieting a panic attack is a form of stillness. You don't let panic chase you around. You don't uh, get on the wrestling mat with panic. You find a way to let it be. In a sense, your body really was made to want to relax. It was made to want peace. And so you can learn uh, disciplines to let peace come and displace the anxiety that is at the center of your experience in a particular moment. I love that image. That's That's from a line in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of Philippians 4. Isn't it wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of our lives? (laughs) It really is wonderful. And that is not an intellectual pursuit. It's fully experiential. Yes. Speaking of experience, we need to, to wrap up. You have a beautiful prayer at the end of the book. Would you mind, as we end, praying that prayer or portion of it over our audience as they are maybe hopefully intrigued to start mm. or, or take the next step in their own journey towards a, a Christ-filled, anxiety-free life in the kingdom of God? Uh, the first thing I would want to pray, and really maybe just say, and then I'll pray, is that I'm very thankful for each one listening to this conversation we're having. Know that you are beloved, dearly beloved, not because of something amazing you've done, uh, but because you are one who's been made by God. And so in that spirit, I'm glad that God is the one who so wanted you, that he chose you to come to him. 
I'm grateful that there are good things God has prepared in advance for you to enjoy and to share with others. And my prayer is that your unhurried influence will grow and that you'll learn to work hard without working hurried. I pray that you know, you'll learn to work closely with God rather than working far from God. And may you learn to be active, but not hyperactive. May you learn to work at the pace of relationship, at the pace of love. May you have eyes to see the people under whom and alongside whom and for whom you serve. May you learn to be productive, but at the pace of peace. And may you resist the temptation to be driven by anxious activity, but instead learn to join Jesus in the very fruitful work he is already doing around you. May you work hard, but at the pace of grace rather than at the pace of driven achievement. May you resist the temptation to outrun grace. May you instead learn to follow grace, to be strengthened by grace, to walk in grace. Where you felt hopeless, may you discover the, the God of hope. Where you felt lonely, may you discover God with you. And where you have felt anxious, may you discover the Prince of Peace. Amen. Mm, amen and amen. You share in your book that you are uh, ordained as an Anglican priest. This felt very much like a blessing at the end of a service. Mm, it's one of my favorite parts of the Anglican tradition is the blessing part. My pastor, again, I go to an Anglican parish as well. I love the blessing he gives every week. He says, life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. Therefore, be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, like as you were praying, it just reminded me of that, just the fullness of that. There's a swiftness in what he's saying, and there's a haste, but to gentleness and to kindness. That's a, that's a Christ-like haste. I think so. so. Holy hurry. Holy hurry. Yes. Holy hurry. Amen to that. Yes. Well, Alan Fadling, truly such a delight to read your book, to learn from you, to, to see Christ through your eyes. Mm. Thank you for that. Thank you for being so vulnerable and so honest in this book. Truly, truly, thank you. Very, very insightful in my own journey towards more Christ-likeness and less anxiety. So mm. from one anxiety-prone person to another, I'm, I'm grateful, so thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful to have a visit again. Hi, Jonah here. Thank you for being part of the Gospel Spice family. If you've enjoyed this episode, you will love receiving our newsletter. It contains value-packed free gifts and rich content each month. It's at gospelspice.com slash sign up. There is always something new and exciting happening around here, and I don't want you to miss out. Sign up at gospelspice.com slash sign up. Did you know Gospel Spice has a YouTube channel? There's exclusive content there too, so join Gospel Spice on YouTube. Also, please give us a star rating and a comment on your podcast listening app. Your reviews actually really do make a difference to help others discover and experience Gospel Spice. As always, we are praying for you. You can confidentially email us your prayer requests and praise items at the email address contact at gospelspice.com. It's our privilege to pray for you. So, I'll leave you with four things to do. Please pick one and do it at your convenience. One, sign up on our website for our newsletter to receive gifts you're going to love. Two, find us on YouTube and see what content we've put together to help you grow closer to Jesus. Three, rate Gospel Spice on your listening app. It's one of the easiest ways to share the gospel. And finally, four, tell us how we can pray for you. Merci. Merci.